let's just say that we've run our unknown and this is the mass that we've observed. Of course, the mass is recorded, does have error associated with it, so we don't know the exact mass, the true mass of our compound, but it should be close to the mass that we've observed. We're also seeing these little isotopes here, and the intensity of those isotopes can be obtained. That might be of use uh, to, to help confine what the possible structures are. But that's really what the exercise is. What is the molecular formula of this particular compound? In order to determine the molecular formula, we really need to have that exact mass. And if we have the, the mass with enough decimal places on it, then we can eliminate many possibilities or come up with a very small list of possible structures or possible formula that correspond to that mass. So you'll notice on this table of isotopes that some of these, these compounds have masses that are a little bit above their nominal mass uh, and some are a little bit below. So that, that difference is what, what creates uh, these exact masses that we've observed. So I'll just run you through a quick example here. Let's just say that we're looking at the, the structure of caffeine, uh, and there's its molecular formula. If this compound happened to be observed by electrospray with a singly charged ion, and we're assuming that it's protonated instead of a sodium in there, then we're going to add one more proton to it. So the formula that we're interested in calculating in this is this one right here. The nominal mass is just a quick calculation, and it's using the rounded off numbers, so we see that the nominal mass that we had observed would be 195. The monoisotopic mass is the masses that we're, we're obtaining um, for the exact masses of those particular isotopes. And uh, you see the number 195.088 and so on. The difference between these two numbers doesn't seem to be much, uh, 0 0.088, uh, but in fact 450 parts per million in the difference is a lot greater than the 10 part per million accuracy that the time of flight has. So make sure that you're dealing with these exact masses as, as they are from the table, the monoisotopic masses for the correct isotopes that you're observing. So we have our mass and we want to do something with it. The best way to work now is, is to use some type of a program, and there are many programs available online, but I'll recommend this one here. So chemcalc.org, uh, that's the site you want to navigate to, and there's no downloading required to use this program, it's all available online you want to click this molecular formula finder tool uh, and that'll bring you to this page here. And essentially what you need to do is enter the mass that you've observed from the time of flight, so not the mass that we know the compound is because we don't know our compound, so you enter what's observed. Uh, and you can confine the elements if you happen to know uh, what elements were in there, but we'll just leave this wide open and, and see what we get. Uh, so right now in calculating it's going to give us every compound that has a mass within a half uh, plus or minus 0.5 of the mass that we've typed in. And it's an extremely long list. Uh, so 1,240 different uh, formula would correspond to a mass of 195 plus or minus a half. But we know that we're better than that. We know that the mass is, is actually within 10 parts per million of the mass that we have observed. So that means uh, these are already ranked according to their uh, how close they are from the, the, the calculated formula. So everything above 10 parts per million we can only immediately eliminate, which is great. Go from 1240 down to 15. The 15 is still a rather long list. How do we know which one of these things there is? And we'd like to confine that, and the, one of the easiest ways to do that is to realize that we don't have the elements chlorine and bromine in there. Uh, you could tell that by the isotope pattern. Um, but I'm also telling this to you right here. We don't have fluorine, there are no halogens in there, and we're going to assume that this is the M plus H as opposed to M plus sodium. So there's no sodium in there as well. And this eliminates, uh, confines the, the possible structures. So this is the short list that we have right now. There are 121 that are within plus or minus 0.5, uh, but we can do a lot better than that. We know that we're, we're only concerned with those that are within 10 parts per million of the mass that we have observed, and there are only five possible uh, formula to work with. We can do one more thing to eliminate, and that's something called the nitrogen rule. So you may be familiar with this rule. The nitrogen rule is essentially for organic compounds that contain these elements here. Um, and what it states is that if the nominal mass is odd, then this indicates that our formula would contain an odd number of nitrogens. An even nominal mass would indicate an even number of nitrogen. So recall that we've observed a mass of 195, and you'd be tempted to say that's odd, so you'd think we can we can go with this rule, but just a second. You see, this mass of 195 actually corresponds to our formula N plus H. The mass of our compound 
would be 194, and I'm just giving you the nominal masses to work with. So this is the, the, the mass that we're really concerned with. Uh, so our compound is an even nominal mass, and therefore it must contain an even number of nitrogen. So if you look back onto this list, you'll see some of them contain odd numbers, which means they are not possibilities. So we're now left with three possible formula. And at this point, I guess you could look at the isotope patterns. You could calculate and, and see if there's anything that can be done there. Of course, the isotopes have error to them as well, so it's not exactly the percentage that you'll be detecting. But some of them uh, might be grossly off. So looking at these formulas, um, from the mass, from the mass spectrometer, there's really no more indication to work with this. Now it's a little bit of chemical intuition. So what are the, the possible chemicals uh, that might have these formulas? You might look at number three, the C4H7N10, and say, well, that's a, that's a weird formula, and look at the degrees of unsaturation, the number of nitrogens compared to carbon. I mean, are there even molecules that have this type of formula? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, so this, this program, ChemSpider, uh, Chem sorry, uh, there's many tools available online, but essentially you just Google the structure, uh, or Google the formula, and see what comes up. And yeah, there's a number of, of possible chemical structures that correspond to that odd-looking formula. Um, looking at another one, uh, well, we have this formula here, and these are the molecules that correspond to it, and there are many more that I didn't list. Um, but which one is the real one? Well, the funny thing is, we don't know. Uh, and you might stare at the screen and say, well, I recognize one of those compounds, and, and you talked about caffeine a little while ago. Um, so, hey, there's caffeine, and it, it has the right mass. So maybe we found the answer. Maybe you did. Um, but I, I would say that at this point, you have a, a suspect. In other words, in a forensics investiga investigation, are we really sure? Are we 100% certain that this is our compound? I would have to say no, but I, I think that the evidence is pointing towards it. But if we really want to know for sure, we need to do a little bit more digging.